And now we come to the keynote that's the closing session for the, today, which is, I'm really looking forward to this. I want to introduce a doctor again to those who weren't here at last session, Dr. Brian Bartabedian. He comes to us from Baylor, where he's a pediatric gastroenterologist at the College of Medicine there. He is considered one of healthcare's most influential voices on technology and medicine. He has written extensively in the online space since 2006 and currently writes about the intersection of medicine and technology on his blog, 33 Charts. And as a personal note, I found it fascinating. I encourage you to sign up to get his blog. As part of a project to capture early 21st century physician thinking, 33 Charts was one of a limited number of blog projects recently selected to be archived in its entirety in the National Library of Medicine. His latest project is The Public Physician, Practical Wisdom for Life in a Connected, Always On World, a publicly available ebook for the iPad written to help physicians navigate public life in the digital age. Let's welcome Brian. Thank you. speak today. It's been a great honor to be here um, since attention is now our uh, greatest commodity, it's great to have your attention. And so um, this is really, truly one of the most exciting times to be in medicine or to be in healthcare for that matter. For most of history, we've all kind of lived this kind of sequestered life where we uh, have contact with only the people immediately around us. And over the past 10 or 15 years, doctors have made uh, and, and healthcare providers have made a step out from our solid existence where we were just communicating with one another out into the public realm. And so that's just what we're going to talk about in kind of a 30,000 foot uh, view over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, this new role, uh, what I've come to call the public practitioner or public provider, um, is a new one. And, and I'm going to go out and, you know, well, let me just suggest that this is something that we're completely unprepared to deal with. Uh, both as uh, people who run nursing schools and medical schools, uh, we're generating a, a generation of providers who really aren't prepared to deal with today's communication environment. So we're just going to open up and talk a little bit about how providers became public. How did we go from this siloed existence into the public space? What were the technological things that got us there? Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about um, why public presence is, is so important for us, why it's, it's kind of a new obligation even for us. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we face out there in the public realm. Um, so uh, in, terms of, in terms of where I came from, uh, my story is kind of indicative of, of what most public physicians and public providers have done. Uh, I started in medical school and I had a freelance writer magazine articles and that led to a uh, book deal in the mid-2000s that uh, we're all solving. Now, at the time, uh, we were now with the social media, okay? And so, to promote a book, all my author friends say that I have a blog. And so, I launched a blog called Apparently Solved in 2007. And I said, I'm just going to, you know, be just to be able to sell books. So, what happened was, about six months into launching this blog, Earlier um, messaging to the product first. And so I wrote a 700 word post on what this meant for the future of the debates. And uh, it turned out it went and hit the, the wires in, in Europe and uh, made around a lot of the financial pages. And uh, some of the executives at the hospital made a call, phone calls from um, folks at uh, Zurich messaging for us. Up until that point, um, I had no concept of what we like to be out in the public space. And after that experience and then another, I realized that being out and being visible um, created this whole lot of new opportunities for us and something we really have to think about. So in 2008, uh, I took a plunge into Twitter. I was one of the first physicians that was on to Twitter at that time. And um, as more and more physicians came into the public space, 
just like we see uh, here in the mid 20th century. Okay, We still see them in this very, very siloed existence. In fact, many administrators in the room probably still see providers just like this. Um, while you know, many of us see this image kind of as endearing, uh, this mindset and this image ignores not only the sovereignty of the connected and power patient, uh, but it overlooks the fact that we're now part of a global network of connected providers and connected uh, physicians. Uh, physicians, it's funny. We look at them specifically. I think it's a very short line, but um, we are testing this uh, kind of very fine style of professional license of practice. Um, when in fact, this is probably one of the biggest things that's impeding us, uh, and it's kind of eating our lunch when it comes to technology and what patients are doing. So, um, of course, um, what happened about 20 years ago was the audience became a publisher. This was sort of a big, huge step in the independent theater, and people developed the capacity to break things, break things down. And that's what kind of drove this communication revolution that we talked about a couple of slides ago. Um, and beyond the audience becoming provider, the, uh, the, uh, the publisher, rather, the provider then became the publisher. And so we as physicians and we as nurses and other allied health professionals are now publishers. You know, it used to be that all information came from the mainstream media or from the vertically integrated hierarchy of healthcare, the nursing institutes, the medical institutes, the AMA, or whatever. But now we're seeing that we as physicians and we as providers uh, uh, can create our information channels and we can And we look at the way providers have interacted with uh, the internet or with media, uh, well, if you look at media for the past couple of thousand years, just about everything that physicians have done has been to fix the information. It's a small and perverted million men, and a great content in the media soon. If you look what happened with Web 2.0, we began to be able to make our own content to talk about that conversation. Okay. Um, actually, in the first round, those of you who are young and better, we were still just sitting with the United States. 
we have a number of two point two things on the internet content and conversation. And so um, it's really this upper part that's um, that's really novel and really new. And this is what defines the public provider. Okay. Uh, so what is, what is, when we talk about a public provider as a discrete entity, um, what are we talking about? Um, okay, the public provider describes our presence and our engagement outside the exam room, right? I mean, it's beyond the traditional confines of the wards or the clinic. It involves not only just social dialogue on places like Twitter and Facebook, but the creation of original media. Um, Simply put, the, the public provider is involved in the dissemination of ideas beyond the confines of traditional filtered media. Okay, traditional journals being filtered media. Once so again, it's all uh, allowed by the democratization of media. So, why should we even care about this? Why should we care about this concept of providers are now uh, in the public realm and having conversations in the public space? Well, this is actually a new responsibility. As we talked a little bit in the last session, um, we have a responsibility as educators with these young nursing students and young medical students to help them adjust to this new role in the public space. Uh, organizations have a responsibility to understand that we as nurses and physicians, we're right and wrong, we're having conversations, and that's just part of, part of life today in the face communication environment. This also needs to be integrated into medical education, CME, and other forms of development. Um, and so we have to start to look at our public role as a way, uh, kind of from a way that's very, very intentional. We look at it now, it's very passive. It's something some of us just do. But as we'll talk about in, in just a moment, this may be something of an obligation that we now have as providers. Um, there's kind of a belief that when, when nurses and doctors write from the public space, that the only thing we can write about is kind of fourth grade level health information for patients. Patients are smarter than that, okay? Um, and and for us as providers, there's lots that we can do to, to use this public platform for good. These are just some of the examples. Uh, public policy, advocacy, and uh, political action are just some of the things that we can do. Uh, and this is something I face when I'm talking to physicians and getting, getting them to uh, build their profiles. Uh, there's more than we can do, you know, more that, that we can do than just create uh, health information. A good example is Dr. Uh, Wes Fisher. He's a cardiac electrophysiologist from Chicago who single-handedly, as a citizen journalist, last year turned the American Board of Internal Medicine up to, upside down. Uh, he hired a forensic uh, accountant and went inside the American Board of Internal Medicine and revealed a whole lot of um, what he felt was corruption-level uh, stuff going on. And this led to um, a huge dialogue, uh, coverage by Newsweek and others. And this is something that never would have happened before providers went out into the public realm. This is something that the AMA would have taken care of. This is something our local medical societies would have taken care of. But now it falls on the shoulders of providers. We're seeing this also happen with patients. Patients are actually, uh, as advocates, are, are, are driving some of these conversations that are happening around healthcare. Um, so they're leading the way with citizen, citizen journalism. Does anyone know who this is, person is? Any, anyone want to guess? Yes. Thank you. 
So I hold priority to keep it in time and place and hold fast and hold it for the long run. I'm not even going to do that, but the reality is we were not out there participating in the public dialogue. We were delaying the new implementations for the other half. And the result was what we saw. So that is not a room. We still don't know. We're still advocating. Uh, this was a um, piece that was published in Las Vegas uh, a summer or two ago. Um, and the title is Doctors Debate for the Need for Vaccines. So, is that where Z Dog is? Yeah. So, Z Dog is not a vaccine, and one says it's crazy, and I call Z Dog and do well. So, he put this up, and so I said, well, I'm going to go to the site, and I'm going to do a comment. So, I went to the Make News today, and uh, left a Start our own awareness, and um, I love to my blog. I love to 
was just picking up uh, by any large immigration. I saw a quarter of the load down as well. This is what we're going to have. We have to get involved in a political arm, and so I'll be starting to get in and come up all this. So, this is another example of how we have to be present as part of the public dialogue. Otherwise, especially in the present people who don't have to have children and mothers and all these depression and not have those problems. So, that makes sense. So, this is part of our, part of our um, thing. This raises this question that I brought up 2009 in my blog. The physicians or the nurses or anyone, do we have a moral obligation to be out of the public dialogue? The whole subject is, well, the doctor choose to do this. I don't know if the doctor chooses to say that idea. Because we have a moral obligation to be doing this. Now, we suggest to you that maybe we should. Um, this is Ralph Hall Emerson. And, um, and about 100 years ago, he wrote uh, an essay um, called Paul uh, Fletcher. And uh, in it, he described the fact that professionals spoke to Knowledge, he translated that knowledge into public consumption. This really is a general mistake in the back of the sentence, and a lot of money translated into that. Um, Alan White was in my teacher about this, and he passed over the time to break down Emerson's story of the public lecture, which was really, really important. And all of us who have made knowledge in public medicine need to consider ourselves part of the lecture. We need to be out there, dig it out, some more information. Advocacy or translate on patients. Um, so, being a doctor used to be really easy. Um, so, go back to what all this happened. Um, you know, being a doctor used to be really easy. You know, you show up, you know, we have to be, be prepared for the medicine we have for the patient, right? Um, make sure our equipment uh, starts and all that sort of thing. And um, everything that they knew about us happened in the exam room. And beyond the hospital, beyond the hospital, but everything was controlled by the American Medical Association. Okay? They decided what our pictures would look like. Even the media got involved. This is Rock, Norman Rockwell, but Dr. Kildare and all these other media things, you know, not all the same. The way I have gray hair was the way I And um, it was easy, but then things got things got really things got really different. Um, the internet came along, and uh, do you guys remember that is? Zidar, Zidar. So um, we start to see another side of the position. Zidar, he is uh, supposed to know how he writes a kind of a rapper, media rapper, writes all that, writes all that things. Huge um, news. Doesn't look like the doctor Phil here doesn't know, right? Um, editor from Lance. Oh, these are guys. These guys are big ER sign guys from Kentucky. They were on the most popular all time podcast, and they were there to deliver the book when I got on the Then uh, Rich Porter, who is the editor of the Lancet, completely wild um, Twitter, Twitter, uh, who did the same criminal attack on the president. And there are others, too. This is the way doctors are presenting themselves, for better or for worse. But, um, you know, a profession that was once entirely dependent upon the AMA for its messaging. Just local societies for press coverage, I guess in the span of a decade or two, has created its own information channels such that we're seeing a side of providers that we never saw before. We can say that some of this is creepy to look at, but it also, for patients, they're seeing a side of us that is uh, unique. Um, and it's also given us the opportunity to have our voices heard by millions of people. Uh, that's when you see Swanson and So when we think about how this is changing things, like in the broad scope of medicine, the medical leaders of tomorrow are going to be the ones who understand this whole public conversation. Um, it's given rise to a new kind of leader. You know, it used to be that leadership in medicine or nursing or any other profession was kind of determined by traditional industrial age measures, right? How many journal publications you had. Um, what institution you're affiliated with, and how much ivy you had outside of your window, right? Um, you know, rank on the academic ladder was conferred by 
who had the podium at that at that big meeting. And well, you know, those who create information in the lab or do clinical research will always be recognized. This is no longer the single variable determining leadership in, in medicine and healthcare. Um, as we see providers like we just pictured starting to collect in new places and new spaces, uh, new rules of influence are starting to apply. Um, the digital age is kind of evolving or morphing or delivering to us a new type of thought leader. A more progressive thought leader, more patient-centric thought leader. Um, and I think what we're going to see with institutions is uh, institutions are going to uh, play to this market and they're going to look to cultivate their own uh, providers who are out in public, nursing leaders and physician leaders who are out having, having dialogue. Um, and competitive institutions will actually drive the conversation, not just respond to it as we're currently seeing now. Look at Boston Children's Hospital has full-time physician creating media. Wendy Sue Swanson, who was pictured just a couple of slides ago, uh, is uh, a paid physician blogger for Seattle Children's. And I think that the dominoes are going to start to fall and these sorts of communication or spokesperson type positions are going to start to um, appear. Now one of the challenges that we that we face with this is the course is of course the fact that there's new ways that docs can be influenced. Okay? I have a fair number of Twitter followers and I'm frequently approached by organizations and pharmaceutical companies that want me to help push their stuff. So what's funny is that my home institutions, they're not onto this idea that people with digital influence are subject to these sorts of financial pressures. But it's a real thing and it's something that going forward we need to think about and educate our young doctors about. Where there's attention, there's money, and wherever there's a large audience, they're going to be subject to this sort of influence. So we have to be very careful of it going forward. So when I talk to docs, okay, it's, it sounds like a pretty, pretty easy slam dunk. Um, docs, again, are still living in the, 19, uh, the 20th century, rather, most of them. Um, but the reality is that a public presence is really inevitable. Um, as David Weinberger from the Harvard Berkman Center has said, that information and communication, and even medical education, continual medication, they're all starting to happen in the same spaces. The first place I look in the morning I, when I get up is Twitter. The last thing I look at when I go to bed is Twitter. My information stream comes through Twitter. That's where I get if something is important, my, my peers will bring it to me. That's how I use human-driven algorithms to make the information world viable for me. So just to bring that back to this point here, that information exchange and education is all happening in these spaces. And uh, as I suggested during the last session on footprint, um, you can either, we can either sort of tell our story or someone else would be happy to do it. These are, these are kind of the, the value propositions that I make to physicians when I'm talking to them. Visibility also creates opportunity. When we think publicly, uh, people want to talk to you, Boston, people want to talk to you, 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 people Thank you. 
this really involves a whole new set of literacies. It's easy for me to sit here and say that you know, every, uh, every nurse and every doctor needs to be out creating the videos and podcasts. Yeah. You don't do that if you don't know how to sell a podcast, right? You don't know how to set up a basic blog. And so we're, saying, we're seeing a, a new set of uh, literacies that we sometimes call digital literacies. That's the capacity and the understanding of how to even take these tools and begin to use them. Um, you know, literacy in you know modern vernacular was the ability to read and write. Um, but a good way to think about it is literacy is skill plus social competency. And so we have to know how to use these tools has to be part of our training. In the old days, we had analog literacies. I learned how to use a, uh, the thing it dictated to. What was that? Record. Um, I used to go to and stuff on the shelves, and uh, we started saying a library, so we went and they kept books on the shelf. We took them out of the book, and then there was a black Xerox machine, it was really cool. But, um, so those are the literacies, how to get through the, how to get in and out of the library really fast, whereas today's, you know, today's literacies, the literacy, you know, one of the challenging questions is what skills will doctors and nurses need to have 30 years from now for choosing nursing students to come through a nurse practitioner what skills are they going to need to have? And we can all predict that these are going to be sort of some understanding of network uh, awareness and collaboration, how to work with lots of information. I think that, I think going back to the early slides, I think a lot of what we used to do with our eyes, our ears, our hands is going to become mechanized and obvious, out of the really And we as humans are going to go back to that human connection. Anything that I could say, not actually really important. And I think look, 50 years from now, the role of the is going to be just that. Calvin Dosen, someone who works with humans in a very, very unique way. Back to challenges again. This is this is another huge challenge that we face with the public provider. Okay, the technology. It's really about the, the ethics. The, the technology is way ahead of the ethics dialogue. Um, we have some great examples of this. This is text messages. All the residents of our institution are looking for They use SMS texting to share information. They said, what is that? They said, you know, using text messages. It's probably your institution, too. Probably with the technology community. And it's just because all of our eyes are based on the same thing. And uh, I guess they keep the loss of text and they were on the server. But again, the lobby to keep up and um, the technology is actually driving a lot of that change. And the physicians, of course, are way behind, but they're catching up. Uh, this is probably this is the big one that we deal with with, with medical students and other undergraduates. Um, this is the balance that we talk about. Everybody that there's a new passive knowledge.